Good morning, everyone. This is Marta Goldsmith. I am the director of the Form Based Codes Institute at Smart Growth America. Thank you all for joining us today. We have an hour uh, to spend together to talk about developing under a form based code. Uh, I'm, we have a large group of folks who uh, signed up. We had 475 people register. So um, there seems to be a lot of interest in this. Uh, what I'd like to do today is to first thank the uh, local um, leadership council of Smart Growth America and Locus of Smart Growth America for co-hosting this with us. Um, it's the first webinar of this kind we've done, and we were very excited about the, the response. Um, so first I'll uh, go over the agenda, um, in, which is now on your screen. Uh, we'll do a quick round of introductions of our presenters. Then I will speak for just a couple of minutes um, about uh, what is a form-based code and how it differs from a conventional code. From then, we'll move into a conversation about why local governments choose to adopt form-based codes. And two of our speakers, Mayor Billy Kaiserling from Buford, South Carolina, and Randy Henderson, who, Randy Hutchson, sorry, Randy, who is um, the manager of design and preservation for the Department of Community Development in Fort Worth, will talk from a public perspective. Then we have two project examples. The village at Hendricks in Conway, Arkansas, which Ward Davis will discuss, and um, the uh, Habersham, which is a uh, large-scale development planned community in Buford, South Carolina. Um, and Patrick Kelly will talk about that project. Then we will all talk about lessons learned, both from the public and the private sector, and we will um, then move into question and answers. Our goal is to have 20 minutes at the end. Because we have such a large group, um, we're asking that people email your questions in. You can email them in at any time. And then at the end of the, uh, for the last 20 minutes, we will repeat the question and some of our panelists will be asked to respond to them. Um, Sean Doyle, who is here with us from SGA, is our Technical advisor, Sean, is there anything missing or anything else we need to say before we get started? That's it. I would just say that um, send your uh, questions in. In the, the lower left hand of your screen, you'll see a little text box, um, and you can type in your questions at any time. We'll gather those and, and collect them and address them at the end. So um, as we get started, the first thing I'll do is introduce all four of our presenters who are on the line and, and ready to share their knowledge with you. We start with Mayor Billy Kaiserling, who's the mayor of Buford, South Carolina. Um, Ward Davis is a principal of High Street Real Estate and Development in uh, Conway, Arkansas. Randy Hutchison is the manager of design and preservation at the Department of Planning and Community Development in Fort Worth, Texas. And Patrick Kelly is president of development Habersham in Buford, South Carolina. And as I said, uh, I'm Marta Goldsmith, and I'm director of the Foreign Based Codes Institute here at Smart Growth America. Um, so as we move to the next slide, I want to speak just briefly about what is a foreign based code and how does it differ from a conventional code. Uh, foreign based codes are zoning codes that were uh, for modern times at least, written to respond to the growing demand for mixed-use walkable urban development. Um, and the first form-based codes were written about 30 years ago for planned communities, and since that time they've been adopted uh, and adapted for a variety of kinds of places. Um, form-based codes are based on principles of urban form, the width of the streets, the design of the streets, the height of the buildings, the fenestrations, um, block sizes, and um, the amount of space that uh, blocks take up, that uh, buildings take up on the, on the block or on the lot, setbacks uh, or build two lines are, are very important in form-based codes. So, they're focused 
depends on what happens outside the building, such as the streets, the building forms, scale and open space, as opposed to what happens inside the buildings uh, or the uses. Now, just about every zoning code has some form-based aspects and some use-based aspects. Um, you rarely or never see a code that is only use-based or only form-based. I think the distinction here is that a form-based code is much more driven by and focused on the form of what happens outside the buildings, while use-based codes are first and foremost focused on, um, on uses. Uh, these the form-based codes tend to provide a regulatory framework for walkable, mixed-use neighborhoods. Um, they encourage walkability and, and diversity and different size units of housing, uh, whether it's single family or uh, multifamily. Um, and they also uh, deal with the parking in a way and other urban forms that, that create a much more um, active and integrated neighborhood. Um, they, and a, a form-based code has, over the years, has I, as I started to say before, is used at different scales. Uh, there are citywide form-based codes, as in Miami, Florida. A Miami 21 code is, is a great example of a citywide code. They're also written for neighborhoods, districts, frequently written for corridors, particularly transit corridors, and in different contexts. They're used most predominantly in urban areas, but they're also used in suburban areas to concentrate uh, intensity of development and to uh, preserve areas that should be less developed, and even in greenfields and more and more in redevelopment areas. So they're really quite um, flexible and diverse. Uh, and um, if you go to our website, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end, we have under resources a library of codes that lists exemplary codes uh, that really operate in all contexts. So um, that I'll stop there now, uh, and because uh, I could go on forever, but there is a lot more information on our website. Um, so now I'd like to turn to uh, our public official representatives who will talk a little bit about why their communities have adopted form-based codes. So Mayor Kaiserling, if you could chat a little bit about Beaufort, South Carolina. I know that the city more recently adopted a form-based code and that Beaufort County has had a form-based code for a while. So I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, for those who don't know, Buford is a 300-year-old town that is filled with lots of history, many old buildings, a National Historic Landmark District, um, <clears throat> surrounded by more tradition, less traditional neighborhoods or neighborhoods of the 50s and 60s, and then outside of the city, where the city is only 13,300, People were surrounded by about 50,000 people who 50,000 people who consider Beaufort their home. So we always get into a little confusion between the city and the county. But back during the recession, our council came together and said, "Okay, we have cut. We've made changes to the way we do operations in the city." But the next step is to really ensure that we're environmentally, culturally, and env environmentally uh, sustainable. Um, we tried before we started, to, while we were developing the code, the first thing we did was a literally a lot by lot, block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood <clears throat> study of the entire city, and we realized that we could probably double our population on our existing footprint. And from a, a fiscal point of view, a service point of view, and of course a livability point of view, this we thought was worth the commitment to spend a long time and a lot of money figuring out how you fit a form-based code on top of a form that is largely developed. Um, 
on the way there, we did a couple of tests. We did a, a brownfield two-block area right in the core of the city called Midtown, and everybody moved in very quickly because the demographics say that walkable close to <clears throat> to town um, is, is important. It sold out very quickly, unfortunately, for the buyers, um, but good for the developers. The prices just sky went sky high because people wanted to be downtown, and they preferred new rather than the restoration of some of our important historic structures, which is is more expensive. But it worked. Um, some of the neighbors who were not part of that um, began to worry that the form-based code was going to create a cookie-cutter look, um, and we assured them that if we can get focused on, on some of the old stock and we wouldn't have 40 houses on two blocks at all that, that had similar design, um, that we could by infill and redevelopment of about 40% of the city we could give the diversity that would, would make it fit a little, a little bit better. Um, the second and probably the most bold project the city ever did was the Boundary Street redevelopment. And we had a mile and a half stretch coming into a historic city with beautiful antebellum homes as well as cottages that were built by slaves during Reconstruction the intercoastal waterway running right through our city with huge oak trees with the moss blowing in, in, in the wind. But when you got to Beaufort and started to enter the city, you thought you were any place USA and you had taken a wrong turn. So we built <clears throat> through the form base, using the form base code, again, as a second experiment. We invested state, federal, and, and, and local dollars in a $33 million dollar um, development called the Mountain Bridge Street Development, which actually gets dedicated um, this this week, and we essentially slowed traffic, put in meat, planted medians, put grass between the sidewalks and the highway, so you didn't feel like you were walking on the highway. Fifteen thousand plants were were planted in this mile stretch. Um, we connect. We begin the connection to the Spanish Moss Trail, which is a four, well, will, when completed, be a 15-mile um, stretch um, of bike paths. And um, we went through two years of misery. Um, businesses struggled. People struggled with traffic. But I have to say that at the end of that two-year period. People are quite excited, and I think there'll be many there to cut the ribbon. But it is extraordinarily walkable. It slowed traffic, calmed traffic. And we also, with partnership with the county and a private organization, the Open Land Trust, um, purchased about three and a half acres where we removed a convenience store that was failing, a huddle house that had already failed, a warehouse that served no purpose, um, an office building that was being outdated. So when you come into Buford now, you're, you're slowed down, you're safer, and we have a buffer, a three-and-a-half-acre buffer that is a passive park, which allows you to see the, the iconic views and trees across, across Battery Creek. So we basically use the form-based code to accent what is great about our city, um, so that when you now drive into Buford, you get a much clearer sense of who we are, and you know you've you've come to the to the right place. Um, the form-based code we we then finished after we did what was called a civic master plan, which goes back to the lot by lot, block by block, um, and we implemented it, and we've just completed uh, a code, a development code to 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 match. Um, what our visual uh, presentation would be like. And that, that has not been as easy. Um, I'm familiar as a realtor and developer with the, 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 the huge difference in, uh, between form-based code and uh, on a, where you have an existing form 
and and the greenfield operation where you actually set the rules before it, before anyone puts in a foundation. So, and change has change has never been easy. Um, it was fascinating when we went through literally dozens of charrettes. Everybody came and they thought it was beautiful. And then what happens, of course, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, is each person in the room runs up to the to the map and looks to see what it does to change their property. And if they see no change, they love it. If they see change, then they begin to buck the system. And it requires um, selling, which is why we did uh, the experimental projects, both of, both of which are acceptable, so that I think we've, we've allowed people to have um, an expectation. So uh, first, environmentally, culturally, and, 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 and um, fiscally sustainable. And the second is that we're growing, and we wanted to try to create a little more predictability so that our, 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 our principal position is this is what we expect. Um, if this is what you plan to do, then you go through the process and you generally get to do it with modifications. If you want to do something very out of the ordinary or something that doesn't fit that plan, then you have to go through a, a much more stringent process to make an argument why you can't comply with the code. It's very exciting to see it happen, but very, very, very different as a realtor and developer. I've done other projects where we basically set a code by example rather than imposing a code upon many people who are afraid of change. It sounds like, uh, Mayor, that um, that you ha you'll have some, some good responses to lessons learned when we get to that part of the program. Um, I think sure. this is a great, great summary for um, what your experience has been and, and why. Um, so, so thank you for that, and we can, we'll circle back to you when we're talking about lessons learned. Thanks. Good. Um, Randy, do you want to talk a little bit about your experience in, in Fort Worth? I know that you have multiple form-based codes and, and have been operating for a while with them. So, um, so I think that the perspective of a larger, a larger city with multiple codes would be particularly interest in, interesting as a contrast to uh, the Buford experience. Sure. Uh, we had our first code in 2006, so uh, it has been a while that we've been administering codes, and we've continued adding to them over the years. And what I'm going to talk about today is intended to complement the bullets on the slide you see right now. So in Fort Worth, almost all of our form-based codes are actually initiated by the community and property owners and not initiated by the city of Fort Worth. Occasionally, the city will step in and help initiate a form-based code where there may be a large project going on. Um, in our downtown, we have a billion dollar Army Corps of Engineers project and it's got a lot of moving parts, it has canals, it has bypass channel, all kinds of new bridges coming in. A community vision was created around that project. So what we did is we codified the vision so as we move forward with all the infrastructure and associated future vertical development it was meeting the goals of the community. And so the strategy in Fort Worth, try, we, our intention is to take this city out of the role of gatekeeper when it comes to any kind of form-based code, design overlay, or historic district. We don't want to be the gatekeepers of those codes. And, and that really gets to uh, the heart of why we rely on the community to come forward to us instead of initiating from our end. Now, in practice, the form-based codes have streamlined the, the development process because it almost eliminates the need for any kind of zone change. For those of you who are city staff or developers, you know that 
uh, any type of zone change can, it can go relatively quickly within three to six months or it may never be realized at all. So a good example would be the form-based code we have on the near south side in Fort Worth, which is directly south of downtown. In the three years before the adoption of that code, we had 36 zone changes. It used up a tremendous amount of time and money for the developer and, quite frankly, a lot of time and effort from city staff trying to process and the community participating in the process of each one of those zone changes. So in the near south side, when the property owners came together, and it's a little, I think it's about 13 to 1,500 acres of urban, uh, urban area forward that developed in the 1800s, early 1900s. All those property owners came together and said, we, we've got to be able to do something different. So they approached the city of Fort Worth with this idea of creating a form-based code. We assisted them, uh, but largely they created the code themselves. Now, in other cases, we have developers who own uh, pretty large uh, chunks of land. And the way it streamlines development for them is it reduces the need for repetitive discussion of the same items, like not having to discuss uh, street width, sidewalks, lot layout, infrastructure, uses, and so on. And as one of these uh, large master plan communities develops, as people move in, then they're already clear on all the future development that's going to take place in that particular community. So it creates predictability for the buyer. Uh, predictability is also increased because the developer of a piece of property is assured that all adjacent property owners have to follow the same set of rules and regulations. The problem we ran into before, uh, once again in the near south side, or it could very well be in any urban area, is you have a mix, a uh, hodgepodge of zoning, right? You may have some industrial, single family, uh, mixed use zoning. You might have a historic district thrown in or a design overlay. And when you're developing, that becomes problematic because if I have mixed use zoning and I want to build a uh, multi-story apartment complex right next to a piece of industrially zoned property, I have no assurance what that'll be in, in the future. And so without a form-based code, I may be reluctant to make that investment. And in closing, uh, we've had a really good response to form-based codes and forward. Like I said earlier, our first code was in 2006. We have multiple form-based codes that we administer. We also have two design overlays and 14 historic districts. And that's it. Thank you, Randy. Um, before, we do have one question that before we move on that I would like to ask you, Mayor Kaiserling, and Randy to comment on, because I think it's, it's one that we get probably as much as, if not more than any other, and, and I think it's particularly helpful to address it here. So um, if either of you could talk about um, community support and uh, how did you go about getting community support for moving forward with a form-based code? What were the points of contention? Um, and uh, how did you address them? Uh, Randy, you want to start? Sure, I'll go first. Um, because most of our codes are driven at, by the community and by the property owner, uh, they handle the community input on their own. Uh, the burden is on them to uh, bring a code forward that has community support uh, before we begin the legislative process. In the two codes where the city had stepped in, we follow a traditional format of doing uh, some sort of visioning exercise, 
and or charrette up front. And then once the community reaches consensus, then we'll actually develop the code, go back, make sure everyone is still on the same page. If they are, we move forward to the legislative process. Thanks, Randy. I think that's helpful. I think also um, we had another question actually here in the room from some of our staff. The reason you have multiple codes is because they cover different districts or areas. Is that correct? That is correct, and I, you know, I, in, in the past I always thought it would be cool to have a code that covered the entire city, uh, but in doing so you tend to lose context, and it becomes very difficult to even codify a small geographic area and think of everything, but you never will. So what, on that note, one of the things we have here is a waiver process uh, to allow developers to respond specifically to their site context. And as long as the waiver meets the development principles and the intent of the code, then it's always supported by staff. And because the gatekeepers of almost all these codes are the community, the developer will work with the community first and bring forward a consensus recommendation before we even get it at staff. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Mayor sure. Kaiserling, just quick, quickly about um, community support and how you said, you know, everybody likes the pictures and the general idea until you start looking at the implications for their particular property. How do, how do you deal with that? Uh, we we had probably twice as many. Well, we met in every community. Um, we probably ended up meeting at least twice in some communities and four and five times in others, <clears throat> because either they didn't get it, but more likely they didn't want to get it because they like everything just as it is. Their their lot is 300 feet wide, and for someone to have a 100 foot wide or a 75 foot lot next to them to create the density that we're trying to create. Again, it's an economic issue as well as, 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 a, as a livability issue, <clears throat> but they had problems with it. So we ended up having to go back and, and we, we did a visioning session for the community, then we had neighborhood meetings, and then we had no, more neighborhood meetings that started meeting with individuals who we found were driving and <clears throat> driving those meetings. And with few exceptions, um, we, we, we finally got buy-in from all neighborhoods. We did make some compromises and said, you know, density in one neighborhood is, is going to be further down the line. It's more important to get the plan with a, with a code in place. But I would say that between our consultants and our staff, we spent literally thousands of hours um, explaining the code and then trying to work through the individual problems that people had. We got to a point that the council built total consensus, and we, we got a little bit hard-dosed, and we went ahead and we, we, we went ahead and wrote the code following visioning. Um, if there's a lesson learned from that is that a boilerplate code can lead you astray and can create contention because typically the boiler the boilerplates are for, for green fields where the developer has all the control from, from the beginning rather than rather than the citizen. And so we we did have to spend a great deal of time picking out things from the Boilerplate that weren't relevant um, and that scared the scared the dickens out of out of, out of people. But this was a multi-year process, and and unlike Fort Worth, which is has more spread out, we're we're our footprint is is relatively small, even though we have a diversity of of, of physical structures in, in our neighborhoods. So we had to try to put it all together. And I think we've done that. Uh, we're coming upon a six-month review of our code um, where we will continue to take out some of the boiler stuff to stay, stick with the, the same. We do have a historic 
historic landmark district that wanted to be exempt. <clears throat> but in fact, the historic landmark district is, is really the model um, for what we anticipate for about the, 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 core, the core of our city. And, 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 it's, and so to exclude them, we, we lost that we would have lost them in the process. So we wanted basically to try to help them help them uh, uh, lead the way and educate people. <clears throat> we did get into an argument because we have a, a separate review process for the uh, historic landmark district, but we one of the ideas for giving predictability was to have a lot more done once the code was written at the staff level. But we seem to have, have made a compromise on that without compromising the landmark district, but still giving guidance to those who were building around it. Great, great. Um, I know that uh, we're, had, we're getting a little bit of an echo, uh, Mayor Kaiserling, when you talk, and I, if others are too, we apologize for that. Um, if you would, uh, we're going to move on now to our project examples. And so, Mayor Kaiserling, if you could mute your phone, that would be great. Um, and our first example, our first project example is the village of Hendricks in Conway, Arkansas. And Ward Davis will be telling us about that project. All right. So the um, I'm, I'm Ward Davis. I was the developer of the village of Hendricks. I've got a real estate uh, development company. High Street Real Estate and Development in uh, Springdale, Arkansas, and in, in, in Northwest Arkansas. We um, operate primarily in Arkansas. Um, I'm also the president of the National Town Builders Association, which is a trade association of, of developers of urban and new urban um, uh, communities around the country. Um, and we have a couple of roundtables each year where we sit around and we talk about exactly the issues that, that we're talking about today. Uh, the Village of Hendricks is a neighborhood that I developed for Hendricks College, which is a small liberal arts school in Conway, Arkansas. Conway is a ring town around um, Little Rock, Arkansas. It's about 20 minutes outside of Little Rock. Um, and uh, it does have a couple of small colleges, and it did have originally a pretty pretty fantastic urban form. So if you actually look at the land plan, and this is a – this is a um, uh, you know, kind of a marketing land plan, so it's 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 uh, it gives better context and aerial photographs and that sort of thing. Uh, you can see that the that around um, the site uh, was a typical grid pattern, so it had a great uh, urban form to begin with. Uh, to orient you on the left or west side of the of the boulevard section that kind of cuts through the cut through the image is Hendricks College. That's the Hendricks College campus. On the east side is the village of Hendricks, the neighborhood I developed. And the, the idea that it was that Hendricks was about a half a mile away from the uh, downtown and was kind of separated by some, some, some industrial areas, and they wanted a more of a downtown feel near the neighborhood that kind of uh, gave a, a second um, node of, of activity in, uh, of urban activity in, in downtown Conway. So to give you some context on the to the site is an is an infill site uh, with um, like I said on, on the college on the west side we've got conventional or a, tradi a traditional neighborhood pattern to the west and south to the north though is a Walmart basically uh, and, and the surrounding out parcels so there's really kind of kind of tough stuff to the north um, and the land plan of the neighborhood. Uh, the idea was for it to to fit relatively seamlessly back in into the community. So we want we wanted something that felt comfortable in the neighborhood architecturally and also um, felt felt comfortable from a from a form standpoint. Um, when we when we started working with Conway, they had just conventional uh, Euclidean zoning, um, and that's kind of the common theme is that um, a lot of places around the country, it's illegal to actually build the form that's already, that's already there in the downtown. So to build the neighborhood that, that surrounded the village of Hendricks was actually illegal under their, under their existing zoning. So that's when we approached them about a form-based form code for the downtown area and for, and, and for our site in particular. Um, the, um, uh, 
the idea was to get a, a decent urban core that also bled into uh, residential neighborhoods as well. And 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 again, I, I keep using the term feels feels comfortable. We we wanted the the commercial and the residential to feel very comfortable together, and also to, to fit really well with with the college. Um, the if you look at the land plan for the for the village itself, you can see that it's built around the, kind of the heart and soul of the neighborhood is the is the square. So we've got a couple of photographs on this slide and the next slide that show uh, commercial buildings around the square. Basically, the gray and the and the brown buildings are are commercial or mixed use buildings. We we did something interesting. We had it. We got approached by a large office user on the north side of the site um, that needed a hundred to build a hundred and fifty thousand square foot building um, it um, it is really in this case used as a buffer and, and a lot of times I like to talk about things that we've done that I that I don't like as much or don't find optimal um, if we would have had a stronger form base code we would have we, we would have been able to better integrate that building and as, as it stands it really is a little bit off by itself and it and it serves as a buffer from from Walmart, but it doesn't but it doesn't integrate into the into the neighborhood as well as the other commercial buildings. And I think as a result, the the office uh, office tenants and office users don't get to enjoy the full the full uh, benefits of the neighborhood. We have actually much more square footage around the square and then and to the south of the neighborhood. Um, the neighborhood itself is about um, 75. Uh, single-family homes, about 140 apartment units, about uh, 150,000 square feet in the large office building. We've got another 150,000 square feet of office as well, and then we have about 50,000 square feet of of retail. So it's a really really nice mix of uses in a very vibrant in a very vibrant uh, neighborhood. The um, one one thing that I will say is the road, the the boulevard section that cuts through the neighbor cuts the neighborhood off from the college is a state highway and a beautiful boulevard section with roundabouts was a very poor second choice relative to actually having a permeable road surface where the college can really integrate uh, with the neighborhood. We have a pedestrian underpass and a pedestrian overpass to connect the, the uh, students with the neighborhood. A, uh, pedestrian crossings like that are an admission of failure and of bad road design. So that is one of the, the elements that people take photographs of, of that portion of the neighborhood and use it as an example of what to do in other places. It is an act, it's actually a terrible example of what to do in other places. You really need to have you really need to have that permeable surface. And that's one of the, we're talking about zoning and form based code today, but a, a, another element when you are implementing a form based code is you need to think a lot about your city's um, uh, technical design standards and what can support a walkable area. So think about road sections, think about utility placement, think about rights of way and that sort of thing. We've gotten very lazy with all of those pieces uh, in places that, are, that have heavy equity and zoning. We have huge rights of way and that sort of thing. All of those erode the, the public realm pretty tremendously. So we spend a lot – We at this point, we won't develop some place that doesn't have a form-based code, but we spend actually a lot of time on technical design standards before we implement a neighborhood. And, in fact, what we've started doing now is having – is, is having our, our our early design work only on the technical standards and get the form-based code approved with technical design standards before we'll actually have a design shred and design the neighborhood. And if a, and if a town's not comfortable in that, that's perfectly fine. We'll develop somewhere else. So that's the, that's a little bit of information about the Village of Hendricks. Um, next slide real quick. We've got a couple more photographs. Um, this, sh this shows some of the, you know, kind of mix of homes and um, the uh, uh, com commercial spaces as well. I will say among the homes, we've got everything from 1,100 square foot homes to, you know, 7,000 square foot homes. So we've got an incredible mix in that 75 homes. So um, anyway, uh, I, I think I'm done with my piece. Um, so we can move on to Patrick. Thank you very much, um, Ward. Let's so that we have uh, a lot of information about uh, all of our information about about projects. Um, Patrick, if you would go ahead and talk about Habersham, and then and then we'll open it up and start responding to some of the good questions we've already received. Hi, this is uh, Patrick Kelly. I'm president of development at uh, Habersham, um, and. Um, 
have a background in town planning, uh, working a few years at uh, the town planning firm of Duane Plater Zeitberg uh, before coming to Habersham about 10 years ago. Um, and uh, my wife actually is a, a planner in the city of Beaufort and has been involved with the form based code there as well. Um, just to back up a little bit of what M Mayor Kaiserling was saying of the public process, you know, I think they had over 90 public meetings, um, you know, going through that form based code uh, process, which is almost a meeting for every 150 people, which is pretty amazing. So, uh, just to reiterate that. Uh, public process is just so important, not only to, you know, get everybody's buy-in, but just to educate. Um, and I think that's, you know, one of my main points is education. Uh, anywhere that's looking to do a form-based code, uh, the educating everybody in your area will be important in the beginning and then important throughout the entire uh, process every single day. Um, so Habersham is in in Beaufort County. It's about seven miles from the historic downtown of, of Beaufort um, and still in what is known as northern Beaufort County. Southern Beaufort County is what a lot of people know with Hilton Head and the Bluffton area. Uh, and it's actually very interesting. You know, all of southern Beaufort County is all of kind of suburban development, gated golf course communities. And northern Beaufort County has, uh, has been almost a mecca of you know, smart growth and form-based codes and new urbanism. And I think a lot of that is, you know, the, the towns realize they have a soul and they want to maintain that soul. And a form-based code and a civic master plan is a way to do that to um, uh, to, to save that, um, that physical environment that everybody loves. You know, the town of Port Royal has a civic master plan. The city of Beaufort does in a form-based code. And now the county has also has a form-based code. Uh, and then there's several new urbanist projects around. Um, so and a lot of that is how Habersham got started. Bob Turner is the developer and uh, town founder of Habersham. And about 30 years ago, you know, he was walking down the, the historic area of uh, Beaufort in the old point with all the, you know, 200, 300-year-old homes. And realized that these houses were getting the highest, you know, price per square foot of anywhere in Beaufort and kind of said, well, why is that? Let's, let's replicate this is what everybody loves so he went and did a, a, a small project in Beaufort basically replicating the historic downtown of Beaufort was a huge success and then he uh, went on to uh, purchase the land uh, that eventually became Habersham. Uh, Habersham is we're actually celebrating our 20th year so uh, we've been uh, developing for 20 years here it's about 270 acres uh, it is a greenfield project um, it's located on the waters of the, the Broad River and with this, um, this, this beautiful live oak uh, forest for uh, the 270 acres, uh, which was, became a, a key component of, of the master plan and preserving some of those old trees to kind of give it that instant uh, charm. Um, when the land was purchased, it was designed and approved as a plan unit development uh, as a suburban cul-de-sac. Uh, development with a thousand units and the whole waterfront, you know, houses backed up to privatize. And uh, so it uh, went through an entire about face. Um, uh, and DPZ did the master plan for Habersham, came in, did a charrette. Um, it was eventually approved for a thousand units still, uh, along with a town center. And that town center has. Uh, there's about 25,000 square feet of commercial that's built right now there. And uh, eventually a build out, we probably won't hit 1,000 units. We'll probably be closer to 870. And there's about 500 units built now um, to kind of give you an idea of how much it's grown. Um, and those units are a mix of, you know, small cottages, medium-sized houses, large houses. Uh, we have a, a six-pack building, what we call is a condos. Uh, six units in a building, um, Savannah Road townhouses, uh, mansion flats, which is simply a, a, a duplex with a unit on the first floor and a unit on the second floor, and then the live work units with the commercial downstairs and the residential uh, above. And with this project, you know, starting 20 years ago uh, when the master plan was done, uh, a lot of these codes were still in the very early stages. and Kind of, you know, what's nice about them is back then they were very, very simple. 
um, and Habersham's entire regulating plan and urban standards, architectural standards, all are all fit on four sheets of letter-sized paper. Um, everything in it uh, is on those four pages, and and we've been working off of that uh, ever since the beginning. It's it's nice because uh, it, it it simply lays out you know the key things that are needed, and then relies on the implementation. You know, um, the people who are implementing it being being able to carry out that vision. And I think you know as we've progressed, and uh, and certainly once you know cities and stuff adopting form-based code, they've become much much more technical um, and maybe a little bit more complicated too. And I think that's to you know to help cover some of that uh, gap to kind of help with that predictability. Um, for for us, you know, doing a private development and administering a, a kind of a private form-based code, the the simple version is uh, much preferred if the team is in place to implement it. Uh, we've been lucky; the, the developer has been here since the beginning. Uh, we have a town architect who's been here since the beginning. We have an ARB. Uh, architecture Review Board, uh, who reviews everything and implementing that urban standards and architectural standards as houses get built and new uh, phases of development are constructed uh, to be sure that uh, that that code is uh, implemented correctly. It's it's basically broken down into three zones: neighborhood edge, neighborhood general, and neighborhood center. And um, the neighborhood is is broken down into uh, pedestrian districts uh, with each of those zones making up uh, those. And the pictures that, uh, so this is the master plan that you're seeing right now, and, and then also the um, regulating plan showing the three zones, it's a little bit hard to read there. But the next slide um, shows just a series of pictures. And what I tried to do is kind of just capture a, a cross-section of going from the, the rural to urban uh, section of Habersham. It, it, it's a unique uh, project in that it captures the entire uh, transect uh, from rural to urban. So, you know, the streets out towards the edge are, don't have curb, they don't have sidewalks, the houses may be bigger, everything's a little bit looser, and then as you work your way towards the middle, you know, the curb may form, sidewalks start appearing on one side of the road, and then on two sides of the roads, and the houses kind of get closer together, uh, get closer to the sidewalk. Uh, and as you work your way to the town center, you start seeing the duplexes and the attached housing, and then you get to the commercial uh, where the businesses are, and it kind of fulfills that entire uh, transect. Uh, so it's a, uh, kind of an interesting project to look at in the way the street sections uh, and everything work, and working off uh, just that simple uh, urban standard four-page uh, code. Um, it's also, this is what you're seeing, the, the master plan is the original 270 acres. We've since purchased an additional 300 to the north uh, and another additional uh, 70 to the east. Um, and the uh, land to the north, uh, the county um, has since done away with planned unit developments, which uh, Habersham was in. And so we were having to go into their conventional zoning, which uh, just, you know, it just wasn't, it just didn't work for what we needed to do to extend the neighborhood. Uh, so we actually wrote a, uh, a traditional neighborhood overlay um, code for them and kind of gave it to them. And they went through it and went through an adoption process. And so we were able to come in under the suburban zoning with this T and D overlay. Um, and then since that happened, the county has since adopted the form based code. Um, and so we have taken the uh, town center portion of that um, future development and brought that into the form based code because of the variety of uh, uses um, that would be uh, available under that form based code. Uh, that weren't quite didn't quite get there with the TND overlay, um, and that's one of the you know the great things about the form-based code. You know the buildings and everything, everything that was allowed with the buildings kind of stayed the same from that TND overlay to the form-based code. But then it opened up a whole 
wide range of, of uses, uh, which we were, uh, the, the commercial district is kind of a, what we're calling the make district, and it's made up of makers, artisans, knowledge, enterprises, what make stands for. And so it's kind of attracting a different type of business that may get into a little bit of kind of craft manufacturing um, and uh, stuff that you wouldn't wouldn't typically find in a in a use based code allowed in a in a town center. And the size of the buildings has a little bit more flexibility. Um, so we will be we just broken ground on the first phase of that. So we spent the last 20 years implementing our own private form based code. We are now. Uh, beginning the expansion of Habersham with a county adopted form based code and then the remainder of that project is under a suburban uh, a traditional neighborhood uh, development overlay uh, part of the code so uh, we've got going through uh, a lot of different uh, ways of implementing the form based code which is has been interesting kind of over the years um, I do want to stop because I want to make sure we have enough time for uh, questions, but I think kind of covered an over, overview of the development. We can address anything that people may have questions for. Thank you, Patrick. That's a, a terrific overview of, of Habersham, and I think the fact that you've had um, so many years of experience operating first under your own, own form-based code and then the county and comparing it with trying to do a similar development under a, um, a conventional code is it has, there's a lot of a lot of learning there. What I'd like to do is to quickly go over some of the lessons learned um, from not only what we've heard today, but other folks that we've talked to over the months and years. What at the same, and I will go very quickly, but I will also try and address some of the questions that we've received as I go through this list. Um, we got a couple of questions about where do you begin with a community and. And I think what we heard from all of our speakers is that, it, that to move to a form-based code requires a lot of education. What does that mean? Well, a form-based code is really the legal implementation of a recently updated comp plan and or a community in, uh, vision. And so the first, the first steps in educating the community, the civic leaders, the elected leaders, and the, and the residents in general, is really through the development of a community and vision. What do you want your community to look like? Where do you want more development? Where do you want less development? That kind of thing. So that's really where you start. And beyond that, I think, um, you then go into a more detailed education of the civic leadership, staff and the public um, collecting input about what they want, but also what the zoning code will lead to um, once they have an idea and why a form-based code will get, will result in the kind of uh, vision or comp plan that the community, the community has um, adopted. We've also found that through the education process as well as in the code itself, the more you can use images to communicate uh, what a code, what the results of a code will be, or what the code requires, the better the better you are. And that is that's one way that form-based codes are different than conventional zoning codes in that they do include a lot of images. Um, as Randy was saying, the goal, and, and I think some of our other speakers were saying, the goal of, of one of the outcomes and goals of a form-based code is that more projects can be reviewed on an administrative uh, basis rather than a project review and um, project uh, it's case by case review basis because the guidelines and what the standards are are clear. Um, that leads to a limit in the use of waivers and exceptions. And um, the clearer those standards are and when those exceptions can be used, the easier it is both for the development community and the administrators of the code. Um, and then as, as Randy pointed out, when you have multiple codes in different areas, if you can have a common template, it's, it's much easier to use. So those are the, some of the lessons um, that we've drawn from both the speakers today and, and others. What I'd like to do now is, in the few minutes we have left, is to go to some of our questions. 
One in particular that um, I would like to ask our speakers to address, uh, it was the first question that came in, and again, it's one we get quite, quite a bit, which is do form-based codes promote NIMBYism, and uh, do they discriminate against low-income housing and housing affordability? So um, if, if we have a speaker, I don't know, Randy, you, you operate in probably a more, uh, well, you and, and the mayor in a, a more economically diverse environment, but this is a question we get a lot about sure. whether form-based codes cause or favor gentrification or whether they actually can accommodate affordable housing and mixed income communities. Um, so maybe we'll look to our uh, our public sector folks. Um, I don't know, Randy, do you want to start on this? Sure, I'll start. I, you know, we've seen a trend here, especially with our historic districts. As a historic district gentrifies, there is a, a tendency of people who live in historic districts to begin to treat them like an HOA instead of a code that is actually administered by the city. And, and that's unfortunate, but I think it's the, the nature of the game. I, I think with the form-based code, it, it can lead to gentrification. We've seen that here in Fort Worth. As you create predictability on an economic landscape uh, in a city, it begins to drive prices up just by that very fact alone. Then when you get the associated development that comes along behind it, it goes up even higher and causes the gentrification to expand. I think for planned communities, uh, developers already have price points in mind, so I, I don't think it really affects them, but I think in, in an urban area, it can be problematic. But you know that occurs under Euclidean zoning too, so I don't think it's uh, limited just to historic districts, design overlays, or form-based codes. This is, this is Ward Davis. Yeah, go oh go ahead, Ward. Yeah. I was going to say that um, yes, I mean you're you're allowing people to build a great urban environment, and there's a lot of demand for that, and there's not enough supply of it. So right now, there in, in the in the U.S., we have a situation where there is a whole lot of demand for great urban neighborhoods, and there's not much supply. So you build a great urban neighborhood, it's going to get bid up. People are because there's not enough supply of it. So if you want to if you want to keep uh, if you want to keep it at a certain price point, build more good stuff. I agree. Yeah, Ward, I think, I think that's a good point. Um, the other thing, and we, we're doing some work now in Charlottesville in a community adjacent to downtown, and what we're finding is that that is form-based codes, that we're working on a form-based code for this neighborhood, they do not cause gentrification. They cause like you said, they create great places where more people want to live, and they they are not um, they do, they don't preclude affordable housing or mixed income housing. However, they also, as any zoning code, they are not tools. They are not the primary tools to create more affordable housing. Uh, you can write density bonuses into in exchange for affordable units into the code if the market allows. But um, it's, it's, the city has to be proactive about an affordable housing policy in a district that has a form-based code just as they do in a district that has a conventional code. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so uh, I, think, I think it really becomes uh, part of the city's objectives to ensure that people of all income levels have great places to live, not just um, people in high income areas. And so we really are um, coming to the end of our time, and we have a couple more minutes, but I'd like to see if any of our speakers have any final comments about this. And I know, let me say a couple of things. One is that um, 
we didn't answer all the questions. We will certainly try to answer as many of them as we can offline. Um, for those of you who seem to have trouble hearing, we have taped the, uh, the whole webinar, and it will be available later this week on SGA's uh, channel, and we will send out an email to let people know how to access it. Any final comments on these topics or the subjects that have come in? Yeah, this is Billy Kajerly. You know, Bob Turner, who Patrick mentioned, who's probably, in my view, the best developer who was ever born. He has focused discipline, and you see what he did with Habersham. Habersham's only problem is is it's not infill in the city of Beaufort. Um, so, Patrick, you can you can next next step is to come and do some infill in Beaufort. But Bob and I did a project in Port Royal when I was in the development business where it was intentionally, it was the alternative to New Point, which was the first project Patrick mentioned. And we built affordable homes, and we created our own code, which the town then adopted, based on the, the three blocks that we built. But what happened, is, as was said earlier, is the market drove those prices up threefold in, in, in less than 10 years. Um, so as community builders, which is what our council would like to think we are, we face the challenge that you mentioned, and that is what policies do we need? Better yet, where do we get the financial resources <clears throat> to provide at least inclusionary zoning? Because we, we will be our downtown historic landmark district will be gentrified, and that's not the kind of community that we seek to build. So it's not the code itself, but the code is the most effective way to, to rebuild a city in our case. But the, the market is, is driving people out and bringing other people in, which I find problematic, but I don't think it's the code that's done it. it it's, it's, it's the market to the man and the inability of people who own these historic homes to maintain them. Before we had the form-based code, the Historic Landmark District did the exact same thing. With the preservation rules that we had, you you had to uh, abide by certain certain regulations, building standards, et cetera, and that, again, chased people out, ran, ran up the price of, of of land and it, it's become gentrified and I, quite frankly that's my my single biggest fear fear is that we 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 have failed to integrate with the form based code a an a let's let's call it affordable houses for the people who live and work here and you know my best friend's the mayor of Charleston and if you look at what's happened in Charleston which Sort of had them. I don't think they have a form-based code or a uniform form-based code, but they have totally changed their population and lost the diversity that that they had. So it, it, yeah, maybe that's the next step um, to to the form-based code is putting the focus on how you keep homes sustainably affordable. Right. I agree with you. It, it, you know, it's part of the larger question. And as I say, just because people shouldn't have to leave just because their community gets better. And that's true under any circumstances. Right now, the market brings that along, and that, that requires a whole set of policies to try and mitigate that. We're going to wrap up now. Uh, again, I want to thank our speakers for their time and their wisdom and their experience. Um, thank you very much. It, I think we met and exceeded, certainly met and exceeded our expectations. And I want to thank all of you who uh, logged in to listen to this first FBCI Smart Growth America website uh, webinar. And we would welcome your thoughts on topics uh, for others. And we will try and answer some of your questions that we weren't able to get to offline. So again, thank you all very much and have a good afternoon.